Hi folks, today let's look at systems of memory, Luba Lukasa and the Congo Inkisi. What exactly are systems of memory? It has a lot to do with the sacred and what we consider sacred, because at the core of this idea of what is sacred is an idea that it retains some value. And the value that it retains is often connected to a sense of history, a sense of cultural identity that is at the core of what that object retains. For an example, you know, what does it mean when you regard actions, words, objects as sacred? Usually they're set apart. They're not everyday kinds of objects. They're given a special place. In Africa, in many cases, they'd be hidden from view. And in a lot of ways, the idea of the sacred is a way of kind of demarcating something so that it doesn't get kind of lost in the shuffle of everyday life. And I make this point because as something is sacred and it's separated from everyday life, it adopts an aura of being special, rare, and distinct. In a way, it has in often functions like we were talking about earlier, a liminal object, an object that is, in a sense, not an everyday object, but an object which has significance in only very special moments, times, places. And at those moments, you want it un polluted or corrupted from everyday life. I make this point because I think often when people think about <clears throat> the sacred in Africa, they say, oh, their whole lives, everything revolves around the sacred. It's all very sacred, everything. And I think we need to make it very clear that the sacred is not everything. It are these special objects that are separated from everyday life. And they're given a special providence to belong in a space that is not all apparent or always uh, in people's lives. So there are two places I want to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about the Luba, who are in Zaire, which is now the Central African Republic of the Congo, and then the Congo, which are actually in another part of that same part of the world. Two Consider something sacred, one of the things that the sacred comes to, as I mentioned, was this idea of memory. That for many societies in Africa that have no means to write down messages or to record their history or genealogies or any ideas of the past in written form, they need to start to develop a kind of mnemonic, a way of recording things. Because if you want any continuity in your life, if you want anything to remain from the past, you have to figure out a way to encode it into some object or into some kind of action. And in some cases, both, you know, an object that is used in a dance or an object that is used as a way of invoking a song or a chant or a poem. All these things reinforce one another and make it easier to re be memorable. And now among the Luba people, they have this very uh, fascinating object called the Lukasa. As you see here, it's sort of this hourglass shaped wooden object encrusted with beads and uh, in a very special organization. And typically there's sort of a tapering in the center and there's usually some kind of knob or thing to indicate which is the topmost portion. And there's some kind of band or barrier across the middle part. Those are sort of the general characteristics of the Lucasa visual. And then often along the back will be blank with some carved incised markings. We'll talk more about those later. First, let's take a look at these beads because they're arranged in a way to record special achievements in a kind of special way, in a kind of cartographic way, and remembering how things can be done. So here is a Luba Lucasa, and all its parts have been kind of described. 
And you'll see that the main characteristic is this divider across the center is sort of creating two different realms. The upper realm is the realm of everyday life, the realm of the royal family, their compound. And the lower realm is a kind of inverse negative mirror of that organization. And this is the realm of the spirits. And the two sort of inform each other. Whatever is true for one, the opposite may be true for the other. And this way, these two realms kind of reinforce each other and their identity and their definition. And the spirit world below gives you some idea of these sort of values that, um, and the placement of these values. So we'll look at some of these specific markers in greater detail. The, the current chief's personal residence surrounded by his title holders. So right here, you see on the upper left portion, this is the chief's residence and the organization of that is about, you know, talking about the way in which the chief and his title holders and each of them would be known and named. So here you're talking about a kind of government organizational chart, talking about the hierarchy and status of the chief and his principal retainers. The center part is the veil or threshold that initiates must pass through. So this barrier here is permeable. And so that people who exist in the real world, people who uh, learn the science of this knowledge of the genealogies and the past and traditional practices, they need to have access to the spirit world to make sure their knowledge is correct, to make sure that what they say is true. And so their representation of this world is often a kind of permeable barrier, permeable barrier. For those who are initiates. Lastly, at the bottom, the spirit capital of the Mududye society. And the Mududye society is the people who are the initiates, the ones who go in and have the knowledge of these objects. And so when the king needs to, you know, be crowned king, there are all kinds of special <clears throat> rituals that must be performed. And those rituals need to be performed in a certain way. And the knowledge of all that is from the Mbudya Association. Here you see an Mbudya reading Luba Lukasa. So to talk about spiritual and spiritual object, we need to look at an idea of magic, that objects have a power <clears throat> to influence the real world. Sir James Fraser was a man uh, 150 years ago who began to study this idea of cultural ideas of magic. And he roughly categorized them into two different kinds. Homeopathy, those magical properties where something looked like something, and it also is called uh, sympathetic magic. Because it looked like something, it would influence that thing. Another thing, a magical principle he identified was called contagion. Things that have contact, but you know, something that is a part of something can influence that thing as well. Now, you're probably familiar with this without really even thinking about it. If, if someone was to say to you, jokingly, make a voodoo doll, what two parts would you need? Well, of course, you need a doll. And then there's something else. It's not any old doll will be a voodoo doll, right? You need the thing that has gotten contact, maybe some hair or fingernails or something that is a part of the person you want that doll to identify with. So in fact, the idea of homeopathy, that the doll, something like a person, and then contagion, something of that person now in the doll, those two things combined really is the, the key ingredients of a lot of magical principles and ideas. And I'll be pointing these out as we look at them over and over again. And it's really kind of extraordinary that so much of what we understand and, and broadly categorize as magic, not the sort of sleight of hand that a magician might do on stage, but the kind of practices that are engaged in systems of memory, cultural practices, divination, all of them have a very important part and role in these memory systems. To begin, we can talk about homeopathy. This idea of like producing like. 
there are lots of ideas like this already in Western civilization going way, way back in time where it was once referred to as the doctrine of signatures, a theory in old natural philosophy before modern science, the outward appearance of a body signals its special properties, its natural healing virtue. There's a relationship between outward qualities and a medical object and the diseases against which is ineffective. So if you won, you're having a headache and there are problems with your brain, you might uh, be asked to eat uh, walnuts because a walnut is like a little brain. And so to help cure your diseased mind, a walnut might have the properties to heal you. So this is the idea of because it looks like a brain, it would, in fact, help your brain. Now, I'm, I, I'm not saying that walnuts will have this property. The next time you eat walnuts, I'm sure they'll probably do very good for your whole body and maybe even your brain. Now, in the Congo, Central Africa, they have a tradition which has now long since disappeared. These objects appear in, a lot in art museums and anthropological museums uh, where they have been collected. But the people who live in this part of Africa today no longer practice this. They have really sort of disappeared. And it belongs to a time when people wanted to have a way of negotiating and, and bargaining and dealing with the unknown. And again, not everyday life, but a kind of part of their life which they felt they were out of control. One of the most common figure, this wooden figure here, is called the Inkisi Inkande. Uh, now, there are lots of different kinds of Inkisi, and collectively, the word for lots of Inkisi is Minkisi. But I'm going to trust me, I'll do my best. When I refer to Inkisi, I'm usually referring to the collective noun Minkisi. So the Inkande, the hunter, is an aggressive spirit, is housed in a wooden form is bristling with nails, it has a raised arm, it has mirrors in its eyes, and it usually has a pouch on its head and in its belly. This Inkisi and Conde is used as a protective spirit. So if someone feels like they've been the subject of fraud or black magic, or witchcraft, they'll go to the, the Inganga, who is a master of the Bilongo, the sacred secret medicines. So it's not the fact that it actually has this figure of a human, right? That's the homeopathy. The idea is that it has this pa packet of medicines, the bilongo. That's the thing that really activates it. And there inside the secret knowledge of the mixtures of weird and strange ingredients are what draw the spirit to inhabit this form. Now, there are lots of different uh, in Kisi, as I mentioned, also, another one is the hunting dog. Um, and again, the dog with two heads, this idea of something that will track down and pursue any evil doers. Now, what are all of the knives and blades sticking out of these creatures? What does that represent? Well, each time somebody has a curse or a, uh, a, a thing that is affecting them, they will bring a nail to the nganga. The Nganga will hammer into the, the effigy and will say, "You're being, you're in pain now. Use that pain against anyone who has caused harm to my client." So again, we have this idea of contagion, and the nail usually has some kind of personal significance. If they feel like their pigs have been cursed, maybe the nail comes from a, the pig pen owners, you know. The, the pen that held their pigs, that, that where the pigs are dying. So there's a sense of some close contagion with this object. And again, this transference of the pain of the nail into the person who has been causing this trouble, not unlike the idea of a voodoo doll. <clears throat> so where did this idea of nails come from? Nails are not common to the Congo region, so they must be and have a historic origins. And there's only speculation here because nobody really knows for certain how this was. But it is an extraordinary coincidence that I shall explain here. In 1483, the Portuguese had sailing vessels <clears throat> sophisticated enough to leave 
uh, the Mediterranean and sailed down along the African coast where they came into contact with the Congo people. Beginning at that time, they began to convert the Congo people to Christianity, traded with them metal objects, nails, but at the same time gave them <clears throat> Christian crosses and tried to encourage them to no longer worship these what they called fetishes, these objects of spirits and demons, these inkisi that they saw everywhere, that the, the priests saw everywhere. But this uh, missionary work did not last very long. By the 17th century, the diseases and the expense of maintaining people in this region collapsed. They could no longer sustain it. And so sometime between the 17th century and the 19th century, when new missions were established, the practice of applying nails <clears throat> to the fetishes began. Because early descriptions of the Nkisi, there's nothing that indicates they used nails in any way, shape, or form. And so, as I say, a very important part of this is the idea of this idea of retribution. Here is an Nkisi uh, incantation. Lord Mitinu, open your ears, be alert. The village, the houses, the people, do you not see us? My pig has disappeared. I can't hold on to a chicken, a goat, a pig, or any money in the house. I have not quarreled with anyone, man or woman. Miwini Mitinu, if anyone is angry with me and it is only a daylight matter, overlook it. But if it is witchcraft, proceed. I think this caveat here is very important, that the black magic is not retribution to ordinary things of, of quarrels that people have. It is meant to be something of a very serious sort that is transgression, that someone is already doing black magic to you. And this is your retribution to those people who are afflicting you with black magic. It's not black magic originally, but it is a kind of counter curse in this regard. I also have other pictures here. It's an inkisi that is a bottle, and you'll notice it is full of all kinds of strange contents and objects. And again, it has this sort of frightening, horrific aspect that's meant to sort of disgust and create a kind of sense of awe and, and wonder in people who encounter it. And this is sort of the effect of the inkisi. But as I say, not all inkisi are for uh, evil or for vanquishing evil or doing harm to people. There are also a variety of inkisi that are used to ease childbirth. And here you see a statue woman. Her pouch on the statue's belly has disappeared. And uh, that often happens because when these things, this is, of course, in a museum now, uh, these things are often either knocked off or they are taken off. You see the, the mirror of the eyes. And again, this was meant to ensure a woman having a safe birth. 